Right, so this is CRT practice solutions. Number one, which table shows a relationship between the values of x and y that represents a linear function? Well, we know a linear function means that for every x input, there's only one y output. So if it's not a function, what do we look for in the x's? Christina, more than one what? Yeah, more than one input that's the same. So the first thing we do is look at all our x's. 1, 2, 3, that's good. Negative 1, 2, 6, that's good. 0, 3, 9, that's good. Negative 2, 0, 3. So first of all, they're all functions. It's just only one of them is a line. So on a line, if I were to graph it, what's the same every time? The y. Well, the y is only one. The slope is like going up a step, up and over, up and over, up and over the same. So I just have to check all the slopes. Okay? So I do this. I do my rise. I do my run. And then I look and I check it. So my rise is 6. My run is 1. Is that equal to my rise is 10? My run is 1? No. The difference between these points is not the same slope. So this does not make a line. So I go to B. Okay? My rise, my rise, my run, my run. And again, I have to check all of it because between every point, you can do a slope triangle, right? So my rise is 3, my run is 3. My rise is 4, my run is oh, 4. Nobody corrected me. And look at that. 3 over 3 is 1, 4 over 4 is 1, so this is equal. So the slope between here and here and the slope between here and here is the same. That's what makes a line. Okay? Number two, Mario draws two circles. The larger circle has a radius of five centimeters. The smaller circle has a radius of two centimeters. What, which is closest to the difference between the circumferences of Mario's circles? Well, obviously we have to know the circumference formula. You were given that when we talked about circles last week in our volume unit. Okay, it doesn't tell us that we can round pi. So pi in this instance has to be 3.14. All right, we're just going to find the uh, two circles. The radius of this one is 5. You were told to always write the props down, draw the shapes, because it makes it easier. So there, doing this is doing the problem. All right, so the circumference of the first one is 3.14 times 5. Okay. Ah, I heard somebody say no. Why isn't it 5, Christina? Ah, very good. We need to continue all the way across. And it's actually 10. Very good. So that means I can move the decimal over one place because I'm multiplied by 10. So 31.4 is my circumference. Okay, do the next one. So circumference equals 3.14 times, in this case, if I went all the way across, it would be 4. So that's 12.56 centimeters. Notice it's not squared or cubed because it's just a straight distance if I stretched it out. So now I'll find the difference between this subtract, 31.4 minus 12.56. Do your subtraction trick with 4, 8, 8, 18.84, which is close to 19. The graph below shows Anna's distance from her home during each hour of a bike ride. So we have our labels. Here's your miles going up. So the farther she goes up, the more miles she's going. And here's her hours going to the right. So the farther right she goes, the longer it's been. It says, during which hour was Anna traveling toward her home? What would the graph look like if she's traveling back towards her home? It'd be going down. Her distance is decreasing. But just so that we understand a little bit, so here Anna starts out at home. That's the origin. So she starts out in the first hour, how far did she go? 12, 12 miles. Then, what did she do for the next two hours? 
You can go anywhere. If you've got a friend's house, you've got band practice, choir practice, soccer practice. And then she left there and had to come back. So her distance went from 12 to 6. Now, between which hours? Well, notice we have between 3 and 5. That's two hours. But if we look at our answers, only one of them is there. So in the fourth hour, she's coming back home, as well as the third hour. Okay, skip that one for now. Which equation has infinitely many solutions? Well, we know that infinitely many means that when I solve this, my variables go away and my number answers on both sides of the equals, they balance. They're the same. So I have 3x minus 5 equals 15 plus 3x. If I were to get rid of the 3x's, Notice you have negative 5 equals 15. That's not true. So this has no solutions. Remember when we did this work? So do the next one. 3x minus 5 equals 3 times 5 minus x. So again, you've got to do your distributive property. So I have 3x minus 5 equals 15 minus 3x. Well, notice these x's are different. So that means there are going to be x's when I'm done. So that means there's going to be one solution. Okay, next one. I'm just going to do the distributive property in my head. So I have 5x plus 15 equals 3x plus 15. Okay, same thing here. My x's are different, so I will be left with x's when I'm done. That means there's going to be x equal to something. Again, that's one solution. And finding the last one obviously is my answer, but just to prove it, that's 5x minus 15 equals negative 15, then that would be plus 5x, because a negative times a negative is a positive. Okay, so the 5x's would cancel, and notice I'm left with negative 15 equals negative 15. That means no matter what I put in there, I'm always going to get the same number on both sides. So this has infinitely many solutions. Okay, number six. Now I'm not going to do the whole problem. I'm just going to get you started so you'll have to finish in your groups. A tutor is paid $12.50 for each hour he works. Which function models the relationship between the number of hours the tutor works X and the total amount in dollars he is paid Y? Well, we know in real life that when I'm paid an hourly wage, I take my money and I multiply it by how many hours I've worked, and then that will equal my total. So if we were to take, in this situation, the tutors paid $12.50 for every hour, we could substitute that information into our, let's call these labels right here, and then that would give us the real life equation. But we know that we have x for the total number of hours and y for the total number of dollars, so we would need to match that up over here. Remember, when we have a function, it's written in slope-intercept form. We don't always have a y-intercept if we start at nothing. So in this case, I'll give you a hint, nobody's giving this guy money before he does his work. So there will be no y-intercept. So that should help you for number six. Okay, we're going to skip number seven for now. Number eight, an equation is shown below. All right, so it's got an equation, it's got some distributive property, it's got some fractions. We have to solve for x. What value of x makes the equation true? So I can get rid of the fraction first if I want, but in this situation, when there's a fraction on the outside parentheses, sometimes that's harder. So we're actually going to do the distributive property first. We're going to multiply here and multiply there. Remember, you have steps now we solve equations. So, distributed property, I have 1 sixth of 36. 1 sixth times 36, or 36 on the top, 6 on the bottom, so I divide. 36 divided by 6 is 6. That's 6 times that 1 makes it 6x. Minus 1 sixth of 12. 1 sixth times 12, or 12 divided by 6 is 2, and 2 times that 1 is 2. Then I have my minus 5x equals 10. And I'm going to do my same change opposite right now. Okay, our next step after distributed properties, combine like terms. 6x and negative 5x is just x. 
and I still have my negative 2 equals 10, and you can finish from there. Number 9, a function is graphed below. So we have something starting at the origin, going up, then it kind of stopped doing what it was doing, and then it comes back down. So the x-axis represents time. So this is our time for all the problems. Which situation is most likely represented by this function? So the total distance in yards that a student walked from her home to school and back to her home of money. So in this case, yards is going to be over here, and the time is there. So she started out at home. So she walked to school, and then it says she walked home. Well, if she walked to school, what does this part right here stand for? That's what you have to figure out. Then she walked home. Does that match what A is telling us? A, B. The value in dollars of a stock that increased and decreased several times during the week. Well, if it increases, it goes up. If it decreases, it goes down. If it happens several times, then our pattern should look something like that. Next one. C. The speed in miles per hour of a wind that blew at a constant rate for a while, then became calm for a few hours, then blew again at the same constant rate as it first blew, but in the opposite direction. So we know if this were wind, the wind blew harder as it went up, and then it stayed calm because it's not going up any farther, and then the wind blew less or decreased. Is that what letter C says? Finally, D, the height above sea level in feet of an airplane that took off, reached a certain altitude, traveled at that altitude for a while, and then landed. So here we have the plane on the ground. It takes off, so it's getting higher and higher and higher over time. Then it stays the same altitude, because we know over here is feet in height, and then it comes back down. So is that what D says? So you have to figure out which one of these words matches the function. Number 10, the shortest distance between point A and point B on the coordinate plane is 5 units. The ordered pair negative 1, 1 describes the location of point A. Which ordered pair could describe the location of point A? Well, let's get out some graph paper. You have graph paper in your computer. So we're at point negative 1, 1. That's right there. Okay, that's point A. We need to find point B, which is five units from point A. Well, I can go ahead and count five units up this way. One, two, three, four, five. There'd be five. But I don't know how I count it diagonally. Because diagonally means that I'm going to have a right triangle. And to find that diagonal distance, which we know would be the hypotenuse, we're going to have a square root in there. And remember, sometimes square roots don't, don't come out so well. So I know that straight line distance is always easy to find. So I could go five units this way, or I could go five units this way, or I could go five units this way. Those are ones I can find. Well, do any of them match my points here? Negative 6 up 6? No. That would be right there. Negative 4 up 3? That would be right there. Over 3 down 2? That would be right there. Over 11 down 12? So it's not giving us any good ones. So now what I have to do is figure out distance by using the Pythagorean Theorem. So if I go back... Take away all these new ones. You've got to go one at a time. So negative 6 up 6. So that distance right here is diagonal. So now we know we have a right triangle. Let's just do this. So I know that distance here is 5. But that distance here is 4. So we got to find that one. Well, there's no way this could be 5 because this is 5. We know the hypotenuse is always longer. So that doesn't work. So now we've got to go to a different one. Okay, let's go to negative 4, 3. So negative 4, 3. It's right there. Well, if we make our right triangle here, well, 
we know that that's not 5 because we can even count over and estimate 1, 2, about 3 and some. So that's just visually not 5. So I don't have to worry about that one. Okay, let's do the third. 3, negative 2. Okay, so let's find that distance. Let's make a right triangle. Okay, so that distance is 4. That distance is 3. Well, this might be 5. So let's do our Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. One of our legs is 4. One of our legs is 3. So we have 16 plus 9 equals C squared. 25 equals C squared. So now I can find the square root. That cancels out the square. And C does equal 5. So we have to use the Pythagorean theorem here on this coordinate plane to find that diagonal distance. So C was our answer. Tara surveys several companies to determine how much they charge for renting different numbers of tables. She uses the survey information to develop a model that can be used to predict the total charge Y in dollars for renting X tables. Tara's model is represented by the equation Y equals 75 plus 1665 per X. Based on Tara's model, which statement about the total charges for renting tables is true? So let's write this down. So first she has to pay $75. So that's where she starts. So technically, on a graph, that would be our y-intercept. Then she's paying $60.65 every hour. That's our constant rate of change. So if you want to put it in slope-intercept form, it would look like this. Okay. Renting each additional table increases the total charge by $16.65. So originally we paid $75. Every new table costs how much? 1665. So renting each each additional table increases the total charge by 1665. Basically that answers it right there. I don't even need to go any farther on that. Okay? We know B is not right because here renting each additional table increases the total charge by that. No, that's what you have to pay originally. That's your one time fee. The total charge for renting two tables is twice the total charge for renting one table. That's true, but we originally had to pay $75, so that has to be included. The more tables I purchase, the less this $75 affects it. So for example, if I only rent one table, that's $16.65 plus $75. It's going to cost me $91.65 for just one table. But what happens if I do two tables? Okay, that's going to be $33.30 for the tables, $75. So that's going to be $108 for two tables. Well, if I now divide that by two, let's see how much it would be for both tables. Because we have to include the beginning part. So that would be $54 and about 50 cents. And then over here, if I divide it by the, two ta by the one table, it was $91.65. So that's quite a bit more. So let's move on. 12, the graph below shows the relationship between the number of minutes X after a water container begins to empty and the number of gallons of water Y remaining in the container. Which equation could represent a water container that empties at a faster rate than the container represented in the graph. Well, first of all, if I look at my line that's graphed, I notice that it has to have a negative slope. It's going up and to the left because something's decreasing. The water's being emptied out. So if I look over here at my answers, that has a positive slope. So that can't be it. There's a negative slope, so that's possible. Here's a negative slope, so that's possible. Here's a positive slope, so that's not possible. So I've narrowed it to B and C. Well, I have a y-intercept. That's where I've started. We want an equation that represents a water container that empties at a faster rate. Faster rate would mean what with the steepness of this line? Right now, the equation for this line is y equals, I'm going from point 
Okay, probably over, so let's say, up one and over about one and a half. So up one, over about one and a half. Okay, so my top number is going to be less than my smaller number. But if I need to make it steeper so that it empties out more, then my line is going to need to do something like that. So remember, the larger your slope, the steeper it is. So which one of these over here would match that idea? Number 13, the table below shows the age and height of each tree planted on the school's grounds. A scatter plot is correctly made from the data in the table, which is shown on the scatter plot. Well, let's go ahead and graph this. Simple enough. So scatter plot. All right. So we'll put age here, height is here, because that's our y. And then age is down here, that's our x. So over 1, up 4. Okay, well, let's actually count by 2s because I can see that I have some of these numbers are going to be off the graph. So over 1, up 4, so I'm counting everything by 2s. Over 2, up 7, 2, 4, 6, 7. Over 4, 2, 4, up 12, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. Over 3, so that's right here, up 9, 2, 4, 6, 8, 9. Okay, over 5, up 15, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 15. Over 1, up 5, so right about there. Over 4, up 13, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, so somewhere right about there. Over 2, up 6, 2, 4, 6. Over 6, up 19, so 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, right about there. So it says one outlier and three data clusters. When outlier means there's a point that's far and away from everything else. Well, you can see these are pretty much all about equally spaced distance, so that's not correct. One outlier and no data clusters. So again, I'm looking at a point that's way far away, abnormally far away from the other ones. And again, we don't see that. So there aren't any outliers. So C, no outliers, that's good, but three data clusters. Data clusters would be something like this. So I see all the points right within each other, and then there's a space, and then there's some more, and then there might be some up here. Those would be data clusters. So we don't have any of those. So finally, no outliers and no data clusters. That's really what is matching this line. So our answer is D. Okay, we'll skip 14 for now. A cone has a circular base with a radius of 6 centimeters. The height of the cone is 12 centimeters. What is the volume? Well, we know from our work that we should draw it so we can put our information in it. Okay, we know our radius is 6. Our height going straight up and down from that radius. Okay, so that's a 90 degree angle is 12. And then our volume formula is pi, r squared height, divided by 3 for a cone. So we have 3.14 times the radius of 6, so it's squared, times the height of 12, and that's divided by 3. Well, I know that 12 and 3 can be simplified. 3 goes in there once, 3 goes in there four times. So there's nothing on the bottom. Okay, so now let's just do our math. We do the power first, so that's 36. Okay. Oh, I should have seen something. Notice all of these answers right here, all that pi in them. So I can go backwards. All right? And I can leave pi as a symbol. So now my radius is 6 squared. My height is 12 divided by 3. So I don't have to worry about 3.14. Okay? I know that 3 goes into 3 once. 3 goes into 4 times, so I can still do my fraction work. So I have pi times 6 squared which is pi times 36. We always put a number in front of a symbol, so 36 pi is my volume, which matches B. So they made it easy by keeping pi as that symbol. Campground charges $14 per night. We know that per always means multiplication. 
plus a one-time fee of $20. That's kind of where we're starting out when we enter the camp. Which function shows the relationship between the number of nights spent at the campground, X, and the total charge, Y, and dollars to camp? So we have slope-intercept form. We know the thing that happens over and over and over every night. The thing that we multiply is my slope term. We know where I start. What do I have to do at the beginning is my y-intercept. So if we look at the information, we just have to determine where did I start out, what did I have to give at the beginning to camp, and then what do I give every night for my slope. I think you can figure it out from there. The graph below shows y is a function of x. Okay. Between which two labeled points is the function increasing? Well, here I'm going from F down to G, so that's decreasing. And obviously from G to H, I'm increasing there. H to J, I stayed the same. J to K, I decreased. So it's between G and H. That was a nice, easy one. The scattered plot below shows the temperatures at different altitudes in an area. So which line best models the data shown in the particular plot? Well, we know we have to draw a line that best fit. fit. So what I do then is I want to have basically as many um, points below the line as above. So if I just kind of graph it, practice, so it's got to be maybe something like, let me see, and I want some points on the line too if I can. Right there I have one, two, three, four, five, six above, one, I don't know, two, three, four, five, six below, I have one on the line. So that kind of seems to match it. I just split them up. I suppose I could go a little bit, no, there'd be too many below there, so I'd have to go out a little bit, maybe more like that. Again, one, two, three, four, five, six above, one, two, three, four, five, six below, that's perfect, and one on the line, that matches. Now, it's a vertical line that intersects the x-axis at 3,000. Well, here's a vertical line at 3,000, so obviously that's not what we need. We need one that matches this. The horizontal line that intersects the y-axis at 55, the horizontal line would be going this direction. So that's not correct. So you can check out the last two and see which one you think matches the one I drew. A linear function passes through the points negative 314 and 2, negative 1. What is the rate of change of the function? Well, I can use my slope, in, my slope formula, y minus y over x minus x, or I could graph it. Okay? Now, we learned a shortcut for this. We learned that if I just make a function table and insert the two sets of points, I can do the subtraction using the table. So I have negative 3, 14 is one point, and 2, negative 1 is the other. So now let's just find the slope. We know the rise is right here, so that's subtracting 15. I know my run is right there. I'm actually adding 5. So we have rise, negative 15, over run, positive 5, so a negative divided by positive is a negative, and 15 divided by 5 is 3. So that's fairly simple. C. A square garden has an area of 36 square meters. The equation below can be used to determine the length in meters of each side of the garden. So this is the formula. One side times the other equals the area. Which expression represents the length of each side of the garden? Well, if I made my square... I know the area inside is 36 square meters. I know that a square has exactly the same length sides. So that's how we get this equation, x squared equals 36. But now, if I want to find the side, I have to actually get x by itself. So what do we do to get rid of that squared right here? You're right. We do the square root. It's kind of like the Pythagorean theorem. That cancels, and then... What's left? X equals that part right there, which we know is 6, but that's not what they're asking us. They're asking us basically if I know how to get rid of a square by doing a square root. So if I were to back up here a second, X is equal to this if I don't actually solve for it, which is letter A. So sometimes you have to look at the answers to know how far to work out the problem. And the last one, Sarah takes a train trip. She records the distance of the train from the train station over several hours as represented in the graph below. 
At what average speed in miles per hour does the train travel away from the station? Well, we know average speed is miles per hour. So let's just go ahead and graph our, our hours, figure out how far we went, and then we can figure out the average. So after one hour, I went, and it looks like I went 25 miles. So 25 miles in one hour. Okay, after two hours, I went 50 miles. So there's 50 miles in two hours. After three hours, I went 75 miles. So what you can see is every hour, I went another 25 miles. So when we find average speed, we call it a unit rate. I want to know how many miles I go in one hour. That's actually answered by the very first slope that I did. So another way to look at this is the thing that's happening over and over, miles per hour, is also the slope. So I went 25 miles in the first hour, and that stayed the same because it was a straight line, wasn't it? If we did our slope triangles, okay, up, over, up, over. The slope has to be the same every time on a straight line. So all I needed to know is how many miles I went after the first hour, 25. All right. Hopefully that helped you.